the cyber competitions are doing very well. And uh, uh, congratulations to you and your coach. What exactly goes on at these competitions and then why, why aren't there more city colleges that are why are there these like, Ivy League schools that are in these oh. state stuff? Well, this competition is uh, cyber defense competition is very, very difficult. And not only is it difficult to do, but there's no way to prepare. There is no textbook. There's no preparation sheet. So it's very hard to know how to prepare a team for it. In fact, the only way I think anybody can do it is to just jump in and lose horribly for like two years to find out what's going on. And because they, and when you, when you do it, you find out there's a whole bunch of rules that they don't tell you. So it's just, it's, it's sort of nuts. And most professors are not willing to do this to their students. And I, I was kind of hesitant about it, but I did it. And we did, in fact, flounder around and, and suffer greatly for a couple of years until we finally learned how to do it. And uh, it's getting better. And I think also under the new administration, CCDC is running much better. So it's getting better. But it, it is the cybersecurity equivalent of like pro football. There are real prizes. The big colleges compete. The same kind of people that compete in pro football. Not are uh, I don't know what they have. I know they got at least trophies. I think it might be cash prizes at the end, but the main thing is you get jobs. You get job offers right away if you win. Really? From like the NSA and all kinds of big companies. Yeah. Uh, what, what courses would, you know, would someone take to prepare for that? Well, any of the security courses here all help, like this one for the web and, and 123, 124, all those help. There's a couple specifically for this purpose. Uh, 140 is the main one. 140 is particularly training for cyber competitions. But um, we are planning to have two or three courses in a rotation so people can constantly be training just like a football team. But when they cut all the cybersecurity program about one month ago, and they were going to cancel the whole thing, I thought our entire participation in this was going to end. But now that they won, it's not clear. So money may appear. So right now we're in a time of great turmoil. We do not know what's going to happen with the team. or the, but, but these people, these people heroically uh, improved our status. So, all right, here's, um, yeah, way to go, CCSF, exactly. It's amazing. They did far better than I thought they would be. Almost made it to the national finals. But even this, they're up in the league of the leading four-year colleges, which is a place where we logically don't belong. And we only have two years to get there. But um, it shows. This is why cybersecurity is a very exciting field, because it is not like physics, where you really have to have expensive equipment and a lot of education to do it. Teenagers in other countries are hacking everybody. <laughs> You can be like a tinkerer in your garage and be just as good as the toughest. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do a piece of that. Is we uh, introduced ourselves and we're like, who are the hackers of this cool school? And we have all these labs. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, child development. And I kind of hacked my spare time. And they kind of looked down on me. And yeah. I was like, okay, we'll just be you know? Yeah, you can't, you can't do that. I remember this happened to, in, about 10 or 15 years ago. This happened to the NSA. They got hacked. The main government servers all got hacked, and so they got the FBI and they hunted it down, and it turned out they were being hacked by a 12-year-old brain-damaged, mentally retarded kid was hacking them, and his mom said, oh, no, he's just playing on the computer, and he on forums learned how to hack, and they, they were really embarrassed. They were like, they thought they were hunting down Osama bin Laden, and it, this was the attacker that cut through everything. It is a crazy field. It is so disorganized and changes so fast. That, yeah. He went on forums and walked, learned some Linux, then he learned some other commands, then he went to places, and he ended up everywhere. There was a guy from Britain that hacked into the NSA because he was a nut. He thought the UFOs had landed in Roswell, and the government was covering it up. That was his motivation, so he hacked into the NSA and stole all their stuff, hunting for pictures of the aliens. He found the pictures of the aliens? He found some blurry pictures of something, which he interpreted as being pictures of the aliens, which is what they always do. But he had committed international terrorism now. We spent the next 10 years trying to extradite him and never did get him. The British said, oh, this guy is mentally ill. We're not going to let you extradite him and lock him up somewhere. We're going to keep him in Britain. But it was, but you know, the, the world's supervillains in the cyber world are not super elite, highly trained geniuses like they want you to think. <laughs> it's just, you know, you have to have a knack for it and you have to spend a lot of time practicing. <laughs> this is like the early days of radio. It was the same. The people on any radio were just, Guys tinkering in their garages and women with their stuff. There's no training, no degrees, no nothing. You just did it and figured it out. <laughs> anyway, so I think um, that's the big news for us. Did you think yeah. about the, when we started with Moon16, but he's on a higher level um, uh, platform and he won a million dollars in Hacker One? Oh, I didn't see that. So somebody won a million dollars in Hacker One. Good. Well, over, over 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and right now, the opposite has happened. Uh, Hacker One has announced they're going to sell penetration tests or something. There's a, a big turmoil in the uh, the bug bounty programs. Um, in fact, very few people really make any money. Just a small number of super elite people do. The rest of people don't really make much. And so they're, the economic model of the bug bounty program is currently in flux. Just like, for example, the gig work, like Uber. A lot of people are saying, you know, this doesn't usually actually result in enough pay to be worth anything, and it's not really... So they're, they're still struggling to find the right economic but model there. Like, yeah. That's the, yeah, that's the standard solution is you hire consultants like Deloitte and you pay them a lot of money and they send these professional guys in suits that have done it a thousand times before and they, they find your vulnerabilities and tell you how to fix them. That's the standard model. But if you don't have the money for that, this bug bounty model is where you, you go through one of these bug bounty programs and they try to guide you into like, collecting reports from essentially for unpaid volunteers right. and you only pay like the first one to find a vulnerability and it um, it's a, a discount alternative much less controlled and people are currently still fighting about how valuable it is the one thing that is really good about it though is that it raises awareness of security since the Department of Defense did a bug bounty about a year ago I've noticed that companies are not as hostile when I tell them they have vulnerabilities I think that really change the environment to where people are not ashamed to admit they have a problem now. Before then, most companies would just say, no, we have no security problems, just get rid of this guy, we cannot ever admit that we have a flaw. And now I think most people have kind of got over that. You've come to accept that everybody has a ton of security problems, you're just gonna spend your life finding them and patching them and finding them and patching them and you might as well just admit it <laughs> and stop trying to pretend that you're better than everybody else. I think, so I think, that, that's an improvement. Anyway, so we're down to this web app stuff, and let's take a look at this. Um, so we're going to talk about authentication. And by the way, uh, B-Sides is just going on, and RSA is coming on Thursday, so if you go to any of those things, they're all worth extra credit. Um, let me know after you're done. Anyway, so um, you, you, if you have any personalized content on your website, then you need people to log in somehow so you know who they are. So you can show them their email and their blog posts and whatever you have. And so you have to somehow determine who they are. Now, the cheapest and easiest way to do it is with a name and password. And that's what HTML forms do. It is also the easiest to hack and defeat. It's the least secure, but it's the cheapest. So it's the most common. What's much better is to combine something with the password to make it two-factor like a physical token or a thumbprint or something. So that if somebody steals the passwords, which they do all the time, they still can't get in because they don't have the other thing that goes with the password. That really makes you a lot safer. Um, SSL certificates are better than, and smart cards are better than passwords because they can't be obvious words. They're long mathematical numbers that are stored on some kind of device and essentially impossible to guess. So they're better in that regard. Um, all right, and there are various ways of encoding it to go over the network. Uh, basic authentication just encodes your password with base64, which is not even encryption, which is not good at all, but if you put it over HTTPS, that adds the encryption and then basic is all right. Um, anyway, uh, then there's Windows integrated authentication. Machines, Windows machines, especially if they are in Windows domains, the domain controller, they are in fact sending these NTLM tokens and Kerberos tokens around the network to authenticate. Those are usually used only within a company, but they are in fact authenticating and there are past the hash attacks and such where you can steal those, but they automatically log in when you connect. This is Microsoft's single sign-on solution, which is a big thing at every company. Um, I, used, I got in this a long time ago. Back in the early 90s, a lot of people had um, netware servers. And you would have a netware server and a Windows server, and you would have to log in twice every morning. First to Windows and then to netware. And everybody said this is for the birds, and they wanted single sign-on. You sign into one device, and then everything else you connect to, it somehow passes some kind of token to prove that you already know who you are. And that's what these Windows integrated things do. And of course, that is intrinsically risky because if somebody can steal or forge that token, they can imitate you, but it saves nobody much wants their employees to have to keep typing in a password over and over, which is the alternative. So everyone does use these single sign-on services. Anyway, so like say, two-factor is much better where you carry one of these RSA tokens or you have a thumbprint reader or what Google did. Google bought those Yubi keys for everybody. Google got hacked a few spectacular times, like China hacked them and other people hacked them. And they said, since they got Yubi keys for everybody, little USB things, nobody has ha got in with phishing anymore. It doesn't work. <coughs> so those, the apparent, those hardware tokens that you have to plug in every time you log in, those make you much safer in practice. 
And these RSA tokens are an earlier version of the same thing where they're generating this number and you have to type it in and uh, generally considered very safe. Although um, RSA did get hacked by, I think the Russians or the Chinese, uh, but it was a big scandal when they did and that compromised our defense systems. How does the new web authing standard? I'm not sure. I think I saw some news about it, but I'm not quite sure how it works out. I know um, there are a variety of standards to handle this two factor stuff and they come and go. So I, I don't, it's a good question, but I don't know anything about that particular standard. Wait, wait, you said yeah. RSA got hacked, so you mean like 2001? In, in around 2010, um, see, RSA sells you these things, and they're not cheap, like 30 bucks each. You buy them for all your employees, and all these things are pumping up and look like random numbers, but they're following a pattern. You predict it the server so they can log in. But RSA had a master key for them all, so they could predict them all, and the Chinese hacked in and stole it. And then they attacked Lockheed Martin, and now we're apparently able to penetrate this, although the official statement of the military was they didn't get in. But of course, if you read any military manuals or watch how this goes, they have to say that. If they got hacked, they must lie about it. That is their duty. You cannot let the enemy know that they got in. You have to tell them, oh, no, that stuff, that was fake stuff they stole. That wasn't the real stuff. And maybe that's true, but even if it was false, they would have to say that. But anyway, that was, that was the point. They did, they, and what RSA, by the way, never admitted this. RSA admitted they'd been hacked, and they said, we will not discuss the consequences of us being hacked with anyone. However, if one of our uh, customers wants to know what happened, they have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and then we'll tell you what happened, but you can't tell anybody else. And just coincidentally, if anybody wants a complete free replacement of all their hardware, we'll do that but they will not discuss what happened. So it leaves to irresponsible people like me to speculate and assume they must have stole the master key. That's my interpretation of this event, but nobody ever admitted anything. And of course, that's also, they have contracts with the military and major government organizations. So even if RSA wanted to come clean, they can't. You know, just like the military, they have to lie because they have too much responsibility. Anyway, um, so there's cryptographic ways to sign in with these uh, security certificates and challenges flying over the network that are, uh, this is more expensive to set up, more expensive to use than password, but of course, much harder to forge. Um, and you talked about these digest systems where some kind of uh, token is sent up. And then the issue is how do you have single sign-on on, on the internet? Within your company, you have like a domain controller and authenticating the domain controller is all you need to finish every system that they know who you are. But on the internet, you've got all these different websites all over the place, and how do they know who you are? Now in practice, it's Facebook or Twitter. Log in with Facebook, log in with Twitter, everybody accepts that. Other people are trying to do it. Microsoft tried it with Windows Hello and Microsoft Passport. They wanted to be the single source for all identity. Nobody went for it. Um, Obama wanted to do this in 2011. He wanted to, he said, people are having to remember too many passwords. We'll just have the US government handle all authentication for everyone. <laughs> You'll just log into the government server and every other website will just trust the government's authentication. Everyone was stunned. It's like some other, I think it was John McCain or something announced he was going to put a base on Mars. And you wake up the next day and people say, what is wrong with you saying this insane stuff? And he just dropped it the next day. Somebody talked to him. It's like when Trump said he was going to secure voting by bringing the Russians over to secure our voting machines. And everyone said, are you out of your mind? Presidents really ought to like, talk to people before they say these stupid things. Anyway, this did not happen, thank God, because the government is much less secure than most companies, and everyone knows that. You would never trust the government login over right, your stuff. Like, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people claim their Twitter got hacked when they say stupid things like this and try to pretend it wasn't really them saying it. You know, but this is a lot of people meddle with security with no idea what they're saying. And this is one example of that. So in reality, this is what it is. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, those are the real universal authenticity. Authentications, that's what everybody really uses for almost every website now. You log in to Twitter, log in to Facebook. Uh, it certainly is a win for them because they don't really have to handle passwords or anything. You just log in with your Facebook account, the Facebook sends you a token, and you don't have to take the responsibility of storing a password or handling it. If you implement OAuth correctly, a lot of them do not implement it correctly, but the whole point of OAuth, which we'll go through quite a bit in a later chapter, is you don't ever see the password at all. You send them to Facebook, they log in with Facebook, and then Facebook sends you a cookie with a random number. You use that number. And now you can tell who they are 
but you don't ever see their Facebook passwords. You do not have to accept responsibility for storing it or handling it at all if you use OAuth correctly. It's a very good system, but it's fairly complicated, and a large number of developers implement it incorrectly, like encryption, and do not, in fact, make it as safe as it should be. Anyway, if you let users choose their passwords, and something like 5% of them will choose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and like almost all of them will choose something in the top 100, and, and even if they choose something unique, it's all been dumped now, so there's a, they, there's a special word for that where they seek stolen passwords and reuse them. That's how people are getting in almost everything. Because there are so many dumps I can find, like I remember Kirk found a few passwords with my name on them. You can find like five or 10 stolen passwords for anybody. And if you just try them everywhere, they'll probably reuse that password somewhere and you're getting in. So um, anyway, if you find any rules about password quality, you can see if there are rules like how long it has to be and whether it has to have capital letters or whatever. If you can self-register, just try to make new accounts with terrible passwords and see how bad they'll take it. Yeah. So, so is the uh, Rocky under uh, how do you do it? Rocky is the original from uh, maybe eight years ago now. Rocky was the first really big breach. So you, if you don't have any clue, just running the Rocky database is a good place to start. But now there have been so many more that you can do even more. If you have your targeting a specific user, you can often go through one of the breaches and find passwords that you already know that user used. That's what some people are doing. But yeah, if you're just trying to attack something, Rock U is a good place to start. What is Rock U? Rock U is the first really big hack. There was some website called Rock U, and they dumped their passwords, and it was some enormous number, like 500 million passwords yeah, or something. It's, uh, like a US it's in Kali. It's, yeah. it's the first really big, real password list. And so if you're going to try to log in someplace by guessing passwords, you start with the Rock U list because those are like 500 million real passwords. So yeah, just a dictionary of them all, yeah. Anyway, so um, you can try to change your password. And so brute force, technically, mathematically, brute force would be all combination of letters, but people usually call a dictionary attack a brute force attack these days, where you just have a large list of passwords and you try them all, um, hoping to get lucky. And since you have a dictionary that is not a dictionary of English words, it's now a dictionary of real passwords that people use, this works almost all the time unless someone actually thinks of something that no one else ever thought of, but that's not very likely. They probably used the name of a band, a license plate, a phone number, you know, something that somebody else used. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Burp has the ability to do this for you. It can do a password guessing attack, but if you don't pay money, they run it really slow to frustrate you. So you're better off to write your own Python script or use uh, one of the hydrides or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, usually not. That's a very good question. If you're man in the middle SSL, the client can detect it because you can't make a certificate that will really pass the validation check. But the server has no way to know that Burp is there because it's just like another browser. There's no, in principle, I don't think there's any way the server could tell if Burp was clever enough. Now, in fact, most free tools do, in fact, mark their traffic. Like if you use a vulnerability scanner, it will put a custom thing in the user agent because they don't want criminals using it. So they will make it easy to spot deliberately, but there's no need for that. You could totally have Bert send exactly the same packets that would come from Firefox and the server would have no way to tell. That's a very good question. Anyway, so I got a brute force uh, project and you can practice using Hydra. Hydra is the main tool people use here. It's named that way because it was written to have multiple threads in C. So it can have like 50 or 100 parallel processes attacking the server. So you can really try thousands and millions of passwords really fast in Hydra if a website is stupid enough to let you try thousands and millions of logins. Now what they ought to do is lock you out after 10 failed logins or something to stop this. But if they don't, then you can seriously try the whole Rock you list and probably get in. Uh, the other thing they should have is a CAPTCHA on the page. So you can't just send a name and password, you have to fill something out. Or you can be like a lot of websites are where they, I'll show you the CAPTCHA after you've failed like five or 10 times and you look pretty suspicious. So they don't bother annoying the legitimate users, but they get rid of the hackers. But if they don't have any such defense, then you can just go for this and you'll probably get in. So then another thing, people, another issue is how do you count how many times they've tried to log in? Now they ought to do it on the server, but just like everything else, it's often more convenient for the web developer to put that data on the client. And so you might see a parameter called the count of failed logins, and you can just keep setting it back, just like everything else. Um, all right. And so uh, here's an example of an insecure lockout. 
Um, if I go to one of these, yeah, here we are, uh, ad.shamsclass.info. Okay. And I've set, I've set my burp, so it's intercepting. This is kind of convenient these days. My burp is intercepting HTTP, but not HTTPS. Now that everything real is HTTPS, this is actually pretty convenient. So now, anything on my page, I do have a non-secure version on my page, so I don't have to keep flipping back and forth so much. So I can load that page, and there it is. So if I should be a uh, login, uh, insecure authentication. Okay, so suppose I got some people here. If I go to Grumpy, it asks me for Grumpy's password. And if I put in Grumpy, it's going to tell me um, invalid password. That you don't have to write password for that guy. But there's one user who is stupid enough to choose an obvious password, which is Dumbo. So if I use Dumbo, Dumbo used the same thing for the username and password. And therefore, the administrator has locked them out. So if you try to log in as Dumbo, you're locked out. You cannot log in. But the reason you're logged out, the way, the technical way they locked you out is unwise. And so if I go here, um, there. First I went to something called Auth1C. And so this one, I sent it the usual stuff. And down here I sent it username equals Dumbo. The response gave me this stuff here. I put it in raw, showed username, um, and now it asks you for the password. So I have to put the password in the next request. So now I send up username Dumbo and password Dumbo and lockout equals one in the cookie. And when I get there, it now tells me you're locked out. So it's pretty obvious what's going on here. I just need to send this to the repeater so I can modify it because you cannot modify anything in the history tab. That's history. But you can modify it in the repeater so I can just change that lockout to zero. And now I'm not locked out anymore. Now, congratulations, I've logged in as Dumbo. So it's the same thing. They have a lockout counter, but they put it on the client where I can change it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it identified what? This thing? Yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah. Oh, all these are different ways to view the same thing. This is the raw text that was sent to the server. This is just the parameters without all this header stuff. So it picked out the parameters from the cookie and the body and just showed them here. So I yeah. Have yeah. Yeah. Name is what? Authentication. Yeah. And what, what is that, if it show up on the view page, where does that thing go? If it showed up on what page? In the render page, where does that thing go? In the render, well, um, over here, what happens is, if you get a response, you'll always see it here. If it does contain HTML, then it will show you the HTML here, and the render here will attempt to render it. So I guess I'm still not really understanding the question. What are you asking about? If the HTML, if the HTML page has a, um, an authentication, Field. Yeah. And authentication then colon something similar to like cookies. Well, it does. You can set a cooker a cookie up here in the header. This one didn't, but you can set a cookie. I asked you. <coughs> What's that? I, I asked you. Later. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess. I guess I'm not getting it. All right. Um, yeah. Maybe later I'll get it. All right. Anyway. So. Um, all right. And oh yeah, we did this one and. Um, so another thing that happens a lot is you have error messages that tell them too much. Like it tells you the password is wrong. It tells you the user is not is wrong. So now you can attack them one by one. You can try users until you find a good username and then try passwords until you get in. So that makes it much easier to get in. So it is much better to not give the user this information. Just say, try again. Um, this happened to AT&T. This is the famous one that got Weave in big trouble. You went to AT&T and you could try typing in an email address and it would tell you if the email was bad. So you could try all the emails until you found the emails of all the AT&T users, and then you could brute force it down here to find their IMEI number once you knew their email. So you could, these two verbose error messages made it possible to just guess emails and then guess IMEI numbers, which was the unique identifier of iPhones and iPads. And Weave was able to get someone to write him a script that would just try all of them. And the result was he stole, I think, 100 million IMEI numbers and ended up in a huge lawsuit over it, being prosecuted 
because he planned to really hurt AT&T by leaking out this information. It was all because AT&T's website had these overly helpful error messages, which could in principle be used for this. And of course, they could have done a lot of things to prevent this. They could have not given you overly informative error messages. They could have had a capture on the page. They could have had some kind of limit where you can only make 10 requests from the same IP address in five minutes or something. But they didn't have any of that. So we just did millions of requests until he deduced everything about the user database. How do you get the, the web pages in order to get the script? To get the script? Oh, well, what? Yeah. Well, well, what the simplest thing is you just catch the request in Wireshark or developer tools and then copy it and put it in your script. Uh, that's what we do. You're doing that in the Violent Python projects in, uh, I think, in this class. I'm not sure. There's, you can do it very easily. You can just go into developer tools or burp or Wireshark and see what the request is, and then you can just send it yourself in a script. In fact, if you put a, a proxy, there's an extension in Burp called requests. And if you, put, I might have it in mind. In fact, let me show you, this is the boss way to do it. I think I do have the requests uh, extension. There is an extender here, and here's my extensions. Yes, I have requests. There's a BAP store, just like there's a Firefox extension for you can put things in here and they're rated, and one of them is requests. And if you put in the requests, if I wanted to attack any website, I like this one, I could just go here to have a request, right click, and copy as requests. And that will write the script for me. Now if I just open a text editor, it will write it in Python for me, right there. That is the Python code that makes that request. Now you can just put a loop and change things. It is so easy, it will make you sick. And, and there's one, it'll automatically make bash code too. So you can write bash shell scripts. And it, so that's an easy way. <coughs> Wait, is that a free version? Yes, that's free. Oh. Yeah, I didn't pay. It's like 500 bucks. I never paid. All I've paid is the free version. No, isn't the uh, Metasploit the old version? Like oh, it probably is. I never used that either. Yeah, you're right. But the free version does a lot of good stuff. Yes, if the website has some kind of protection against this, then you'll run that script and you'll find that it doesn't let you make too many requests before it stops answering. Which is what they should do, but a lot of people weren't on board with it, and a few years ago, AT&T was not on board with it. That's why they have to learn, you know, exactly. It's pretty easy to protect yourself against this if you think about it. You really shouldn't let people try to log in more than 10 times in an hour or something. If they are, then obviously they're an attacker, they're not a real customer. Or they're so lost, and you should send them to tech support and have someone call them and talk to them if they really can't get in. But there's no point letting them try a thousand logins. They're obviously up to no good. They don't do time lock either. So if you're doing it from yeah. midnight to 6 a.m., you've got to be no good if you are out of town. Oh, sure. That's another option. Yeah, you might just have certain times of day when they're in. Anyway, so those are all good things. So anyway, um, username enumeration is finding the valid usernames. And if, even if you don't ever find the password, just the username itself is often enough to do harm. For example, if you get that database of email addresses, now you can send them spam and say, AT&T has been hacked. We, you know, you have an AT&T account. You have to click here to reset your password or something or offer them a credit card from my special company, a special deal for AT&T customers. You know, once you know something about somebody, you can make a more plausible phishing email. Yeah. Uh, my mother gets those all the time. I never get them. Is it like they know that it's like dumb old person doesn't know how to use computers? Uh, well, um, <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact, there are, well, they have lists, of course, just like paper mail. They have lists that are sold back and forth among the spammers. And the main thing is if you ever click on like the unsubscribe link, then they know you're really a sucker. If you click on a link in an email, you go on the high value list. Here's, we got one now. They, they read emails and they click on things. We can get them. People would just throw them away or it's automatically thrown away by a spam folder. They probably don't get on the list. So, but a lot of it's just random. But uh, there are patterns and I don't really know. Uh, there are people that now that increasingly that do threat analysis. Who's hacking you and how they operate. And uh, one of my ex-students works at, uh, he went off and got a job in town at an IR company. And he publishes a lot of these on Twitter. And he goes and analyzes spam and analyzes the companies and finds out what their latest campaign is. You'll see a lot of news about that. Um, People do analyze the criminal campaigns and the government campaigns so you know who's attacking you. And the DHS alerts, which you can get um, by joining um, InfraGuard and by joining uh, um, the 
High Tech Crime Investigators Association, if you join these groups, you get the official DHS alerts and they consist of warning you which campaign is coming, which type of malware, what country is throwing it at you, so you know what to look for. So it does help, but I don't know a specific answer to that one. Anyway, so um, another thing, Bert makes this easier. Another thing that will happen is even if people don't deliberately have a page that says username wrong or password wrong, in fact, those are different pages from the server that just happen to be different in a small way. So Bert does have a comparer where it will take the complete text of one page, then you send another request and it'll tell you, highlight the differences, like the diff tool in Unix. So you can see if there is even a tiny difference between bad username and bad password, and then you can use that to enumerate it. Um, so I tried it for hackers on and I didn't find anything, but it, it's easy enough. This is what I did. And the only thing different, I made two accounts, demo 143 and demo 144, and the only difference is the name. There was no other difference on the page. So hackers on does not have this flaw. Anyway, I got some cahoots about this stuff. Let me bring them up. Did you write hackathon yourself? What's that? Did you write hackathon? Oh, I did not write hackathon. No. Somebody else did. OWASP did it. Hackathon is too big for me. Yeah. Uh, you see, the stuff I write is real simple. I wrote like these little cookie login pages and stuff. So just get all of their stuff. I did, in fact, fix Hackazon. Hackazon, one of the SQL injections, did not work, and I actually found it and fixed it. And they said they were going to pay me 10 bucks, but they didn't. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I don't think they did. Of course, they might have put it in. Do you have their website on the website? Do you have open source? Yes, it's on GitHub. Anything on GitHub, you can fix it. And I actually forked it and fixed it. It's like the only thing I ever did properly on GitHub so far. There's a way to contribute to open source software. There's a whole thing you're supposed to do, and I really never have done it except that one time yet. I'm not supposed to just put all my scripts on my own website like this. That's for amateurs. But I just can't be bothered. But, you know, if I ever, like, join the proper realm of modern developer conventions, I'll be putting all my stuff on GitHub and fixing the bugs and encouraging other people oh, to use it. But I never... Um, the problem is, I, I never actually finish my stuff. I get it working in class, and then I lose interest. And people, other people want to use it, and I say, man, if you saw my code, you wouldn't want it. And uh, I, my, I never, like, finish polishing something to where it would really be any use to anybody else. But I might get there. Oh, I, we're missing the glorious Kahoot music. Let's see. Um, I have to hit. It is, probably. And I have to figure out how to get this bar to let me add it. Oh, oh, oh I'm connected. Kind of, uh, there a sound button on the back? Well, there's there, I finally, some, there's, a, there's a bunch, wait, that's the brightness. There used to be a sound button somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did in fact do that in a previous class. It looks like somehow the sound is hosed. It's all grayed out and it won't let me edit. it. I, uh, it must think it's going to external speakers or something. Um, MacBook Pro speakers, okay. Um, no, somehow... This is the problem with the smart Mac. This, this smart bar has taken away my sound controls, and I don't know how to get them back. One of my smart students might know how to get the sound back. If you figure it out, let me know. Anyway, we'll do it without the sound until somebody figures out how to defeat the Mac's intelligence. I has a thing here, and there's sound buttons, but it, it won't do anything. It won't bring up the bar that lets me adjust the sound. It's too smart. Zoom is taking over, and Zoom is not letting go of the bar, so I can get at the sound controls. Now, when I connect with HDMI or whatever this other thing is, HDMI, this other thing, it, the sound goes outside there. But this is connecting with the old-fashioned RGB thing, VGA. So the sound is not going out there, but some part of this nonsense seems to think it is. Anyway, we're stuck with no sound until somebody tells me how to operate my computer. Anyway, um, so which hash function? Wait, this is the wrong class. That's 141. This is 129S. All right, just a moment while I try to figure out what in the world I'm doing here. Um, 129S, Chapter 6. Um, it would help if I put up the right questions. Uh, you would turn on the sound before you start it. Well, but it, I, no, I can't. It won't let me do it. They're just grayed out. Somehow the sound is disabled. I know. Apparently, apparently no sound today until I get an education on how to operate my computer. And uh, that's life. But there should be another, there should be a 6A. And where is it? This is what they do if you don't pay them, is they don't sort things. And I was afraid of this. 
Right. Wonder how they make money. Well, it could be. I think it must be in the wrong class. <coughs> Maybe this one? Let's see what these look like. Nope, that's not it. Okay. Well, we're not going to do 6A either. I can't find it. Okay. We'll just carry on. 6B exists. I'm, I knew something was going to happen. All right. So uh, anyway, I can't get the sound and I can't get the cahoots. We'll just carry on with whatever portion of this nonsense works. So um, all right. So if you're sending credentials and they aren't encrypted correctly, anybody can be sniffing it anywhere in your wireless network, the wired network, um, and uh, anywhere between you and the other end. And so people say use HTTPS, and that will solve the problem. And HTTPS only solves a small number of problems. HTTPS means someone on the side cannot decrypt the traffic, and it means someone in the middle can't decrypt the traffic unless you will click through an error message or your client is broken and not verifying it. So that's something. But um, the data is in clear text on your machine, and it's in clear text on the server, and it's often foolishly used at those ends. So it's going to be in your favorites, in your history, on your machine. It's going to be in the RAM of your machine, often in plain text. It's going to be in the server logs. It's going to be in the logs of the reverse proxies at the other end. The encryption only encrypts it in transit. Once it gets there, it's in the clear again, and it can be misused there. Um, and if I do something like cross-site scripting, I trick your machine into sending an extra copy to another server, and encryption won't save you. It will just encrypt it and send it to that server with the key I can use. So, you know, a lot of these attacks will still work fine over HTTPS. HTTPS does not mean you're safe. It just stops a certain category of attack, like listening from the side. Um, so here's some cross-site scripting demos, and they work perfectly fine over HTTPS. And that's how I'm going to do them, so I don't have to go through the... Um, uh, um, through the proxy. So some, I'll just do it here, I guess. Games. Okay, there we are. And so we did the um, authentication insecurities. And these are cross-site scripting. Okay, so here's cross-site scripting. I have a message, and when I submit it, it prints. This error message, developer is drunk. Okay, so I can put, now this is, I can put any kind of message there, and it will put that, text on the next page. This is very common at search engines. You search for frogs, the next page says results for frogs. It repeats something you said. If never this happens, you often have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So if I put a script that does something, this is the standard one people do, an alert box, just to show the volume. I put that in here. Then the next page has an alert box pop up. By the way, this is so common that most browsers block it. Firefox is the only browser that will let you get away with it anymore. The others have all put in anti-XSS defenses, and you have to sneak past them, which is more difficult. So now I can inject scripts and run on the machine. All right. So what harm can that do? And that would be here. Um, if I look at here, that's called reflected SSS, where I send data, and it comes back and uh, executes on my machine. So here is an on-click tag, where when you click it, it does something. That's easy enough to do. Here's on-click alert. But since I alerted with a plain text, I could alert with document.cookie. Now, this cookie can contain your login information, and usually it does. Usually that cookie is all you need to authenticate. So if I can steal your cookie, I'm in your account. As if I, as a matter of fact, it's usually more powerful than knowing your password, because if you change your password, the cookie typically does not change. It is less valuable than your password if you reuse passwords. But anyway, the cookie is very valuable to steal. Yeah? Wait, so if the page doesn't display user name, Yes, if the page does not display user input, then you don't have simple reflected cross-site scripting. There are other kinds. You might find some other way to add code that gets sent to the browser, like you might be able to send it in the user agent or something. But yeah, if you don't display user input, then this simple type doesn't work. But there are a bunch of other types we'll talk about. Oh. Yeah. And then here, so here's, so if I can, I can pop up a box, I can pop up a box with a cookie, and here I'm going to send it to a remote site. I'm going to send it, so if I can open, here I can open a pop-up window that comes up and puts an image on the page. This is often used to add malware to pages. If I can put scripts on a page, I can add code from another website to the page and infect you with malware. And your browser and your antivirus and your search engine will all blame this website for it. So you will get flagged for having malware on your site when you don't even have malware on your site. You have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, which people are using to add malware to the page that users see. And then here's the one that sends the cookie to a remote log. 
it's going to open and send it to a log on a remote server. So I'm saving the cookie somewhere else. This is the real finished attack. You write a PHP page that takes the cookie and sends it to a remote server. And, and this all happens perfectly fine over HTTPS. My browser is encrypting it and sending it to a remote server, as I was told to. This is something you might want to do for a variety of good reasons, like you might be doing OAuth authentication with Facebook, where you, wow, I want to take some data from here and send it over to Facebook. It, your browser does not know that this is evil. But I can send your data to a third party, and they've got it. This is why you should not let a cookie be the only authentication. It should be the cookie plus other information about you, like your IP address or something, so that if I steal your cookie, I can't get in. It's the same as two-factor authentication. The cookie alone should not get in, and the password alone should not get in if you don't want to fall victim to this. But most sites have the minimum security, so they fall for this. It's like not having any kind of rate limiting, so you can let me try a million requests. You know, these are the wimps. But this is almost everybody where the simplest attack is enough to get in. Anyway, so that's, there's that one. And um, all right, so a password changes. People like this. This is some uh, recommendation that's been around for 20 years. Everybody should be forced to change their password every 60 days or something. They, about a year ago, they finally relented and said, you know, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, what sense does this, do I actually think I stole your password and the fact that you change it 60 days later is somehow going to save you from being hacked? What? This doesn't make a lick of sense. It never has. And the end users have always known, you're just wasting my time. I'm just going to change it and change it back so I can keep using the same password. Anyway, so that's finally been removed from the official recommendation. But it was the government official recommendation for 20 years, and everybody's making that people do it, and everybody hated them for it. And this helped contribute to the security culture where everybody knows the security people are idiots, and you just have to defeat their protocols because all they do is ruin your life for no good reason. Anyway, so... um. If you have a password change system, this is a huge vulnerability. This is how they got in many people's accounts because the problem is if you make your employees use passwords or those tokens or something, then of course a steady stream of employees are going to forget their password, lose their token, and not be able to do their job because they can't get in. So you're going to have to have some kind of way of retrieving a lost password. And unless you are willing to pay a lot of money and have a human talk to them on the phone or make them drive to the office, you're going to have to have some automated system that they can use without their password. Ask for something simple like, like the town they were born in or their mother's maiden name or something, and that information is pretty easy to guess. So typically, the past lost password recovery system uses this thing called identity proofing, which is some other evidence of who you are, and that is usually really weak. And it's very easy to get in anybody's account this way. They got in Sarah Palin's account because her identity proofing question was the town where you met your husband in. And it was just the town where she went to high school. You could see it on her resume. You know, almost everybody's like that. So almost all security is, in fact, paper thin. And there are obvious ways in and the bad guys know that. You can't send it across as a... Uh, your thumbprint would be better sent. because it's not public. It, but it's very easy to get with a targeted attack. You're leaving it everywhere you go. So all I have to do is go to the restaurant and get your, your fork or something. I get it. But I can't get a million of them too easily, so it's better. Yeah? So two-factor Two-factor is very good. Um, some people have even three-factor. Uh, military bases have all these things. Time restrictions. Not to, you know, The best procedure is defense in depth, where you have many tests. You test for suspicious behavior. You test for suspicious login behavior. You check the timing of the keystrokes. You know, you can go to town, you check the network traffic. You know, you need to have many layers of defense because attackers can defeat any one of these. But um, if you just make them work harder and harder to get in, and the more of that you do, the more attackers you screen out. Yeah? Yeah, like in the movie uh, Mission Impossible, like, yeah. you know, they have a camera that, that chases the guy and see, tracks the guy's movement as mm -hmm. he walks like, down the front. Yeah, they look at your Isn't walk, that yeah. Like real, or is that I don't know about that specific technology, but it certainly is true to behavioral biometrics that look at the way you move and the way you talk and the way your hand moves when you're typing. They, right. That's a real thing. Oh, okay. And yeah. Yeah, there are some of the major banks, like uh, the Credit Card, the City Bank, yeah. they're asking now to do a voice print on me so that yeah. can't call up the terms. The voice print has been big in science fiction. In practice, it has been a flop because people's voice changes a lot. They get a cold. And so it turns out, in practice, voice print has generally not worked out very well. There's too many false negatives. But maybe they've improved it. I think it has improved lately. In the last five years, they now have, you know, say yes or no on the phone, and you can actually tell the difference between yes or no. 
So the technology to understand voices is much better than it used to be. Maybe they finally can recognize a voice because humans can totally recognize a voice. I think AI might be getting to where it can recognize a voice. Anyway, these are- Yes. Yes, callback is a very good, um, simple uh, second factor where you can't log in. All you can do is request a connection and then we will call you at your known number. Then nobody else can get in except the person with your real expected cell phone. That was good back in the days of dial-up. Nowadays, not so good because you're not really connecting through your phone. Some of yeah. us have phone phones. Yeah. yeah. I read somewhere that your iris of your eye and fingerprint are the only things that are unique. Everything else can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah really people bad. argue. Yeah, people argue about well, they can be. Yeah, they're right. But the, the iris is the best, but the most expensive. The fingerprint is the cheapest and most common biometric. There are veins in the hand. There's the bone structure, the face. There's a bunch of them, but those are the most common ones: fingerprints and iris. Couldn't someone buy someone's like, you know, you have eye surgery, so they're putting a new lens, couldn't just get a similar lens? Uh, no, the lens is not what they look at. They're looking at the colored part in the back of your eye, and that you never have replaced, even if you have surgery. So it's pretty good. Anyway, these are all very good points. So anyway, you have a password change, speech, someone connects, you validate their password, you somehow get a new password, and then feedback some conditions. And this multiple step process often has logic flaws. This is often the weakest link, the, the secondary challenge. Uh, often there's a small set of answers you can just brute force them. Like I've seen ones that ask you like your favorite color or something. Well, there's only like five or 10 common colors. So you can pretty quickly guess them all. Um, Actually, yeah. I forgot one. Yeah. Uh, DUI. So your friend can just read in the breathalyzer for you and then start the car. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's another one. That's, that's a common one. Yeah. You send a, a uh, swooping attack. Now, if you let users write their own question, this is like letting users pick their own password. They will almost always choose something incredibly stupid. Um, and so, like, do I own a boat? Something with a yes or no answer or something. And people choose password hints. This happened to a major website about six years ago. They lost all the password hints. And almost all the password hints were just equal to the password, so you could totally get in. If you let people write a hint, they just put the password there. Oh, I forgot my password. Oh, it's right here in the hint. Or it was something incredibly obvious, like a verbal description of the password. You know, what else is it going to be? Um, anyway, so uh, the, often the mechanism, even after you pass the identity proofing, it has to somehow deliver a new password to you. So they used to do things like email it to you or SMS it to you. Now, that's, of course, pretty easy to intercept. Another thing uh, they do is email you some kind of link with a long number that you click to get back in. And often that number is predictable or findable somewhere. So, you know, there's another place where it tends to go wrong. Um, all right. Uh, it's sometime to remember me function that you'll see, where you don't have to keep logging in. It has to remember who you are. Sometimes it just remembers a simple persistent cookie. This happens a lot. One of the students in my 128 class already found an app that does this. It just gives you a number, and it's a short, predictable number. And if you change this number, you're in other people's accounts. This happens all over the place. If you do find anything like this, please talk to me before you disclose it because you get prosecuted. This happened to a college student. Their college had this uh, cmycollege.edu grades ID equals number. And he tried just changing that number. He was seeing some other students' grades. And the college expelled him and tried to prosecute him for that. So you got to be aware. Even when they're doing something mind-numbingly stupid, they may choose to prosecute. And unfortunately, the law is on their side. The law says you are not allowed to do anything which gets you in someone else's account, no matter how easy it is. You're an evil hacker if you did that. So you need a lawyer. It's a outside I tried that. I tried to hack into a Belize server, and my lawyer told me, even if you hack a site in another country, you're still breaking U.S. law. It's just no fun at all. I felt really ripped off. But don't they have to like, come here and you? No, they would have to if they wanted to. But in principle, the American law enforcement could prosecute you for doing it. This is like the, there's people that go to Thailand to have sex with underage women. And the, they announced like four years ago that the U.S. Department of Justice is going to prosecute people here for doing that because they don't like it, even though they do not have someone in Thailand, standing it was the victim complaining, you can still be prosecuted here for violating U.S. law somewhere else. So that's a thing to know. That's what my lawyer said. I don't really know exactly how it works, but I wanted to hack into a server in Belize and he said I, I couldn't do it. Yeah, but I don't want to be getting away with stuff. I, I don't want to have to lie about what I'm doing. I said, I'm not doing it unless it's really legal. I thought it was legal, but he said it's not. Yeah. 
acquire somebody in a foreign country in the U.S. to prosecute in Texas? I think so, yes. I think that's the point. You can't just go commit crimes elsewhere. Anyway, so that's Remember Me. And even if the user ID or section token is encrypted, you can steal it with cross-site scripting like we saw here, or by just stealing your phone and getting it off of there. Then there's user impersonation. This is often the case. Often the help desk person can log into your account so they can see your problem. And therefore, there's another way to get in. And often that's something incredibly obvious like uh, an impersonator.jsp page or a parameter so you can imitate someone else. Um, is, um, yeah. Is cross-site scripting uh, can be fixed at the um, it, it, it can be, cross-site scripting can be addressed at various levels. At the server side, yes, you can fix it because you can make it so that anything the user puts in is scrubbed so you're moved to less than and greater than size. That will do a lot. That is the best solution. You can also fix it on the client side, which is what most browsers do now. Most browsers detect obvious cross-site scripting and block it. Uh, so you can fix it at both ends. And that's a good idea too, of course, because all the fixes are imperfect. So what's that scripting? Is just a script inside the web page? Yeah, you're, you're taking data from the user, which is then used to construct the next page, and you should be scrubbing the tags out of it. That's all these web flaws are failures of, of input validation. You somehow take input, which is supposed to be used for one purpose, and somehow they trick you into misunderstanding the input and having it have unexpected effects. All these attacks work basically on that premise. And so the answer in principle is if you really understood what all the attacks were, you could scrub all that bad stuff out of the input. That just turns out to be very difficult in practice, just like antivirus. All you have to do is list all the bad files and block them. Well, it turns out listing all the bad files that are possible is a lot harder than you might think. And listing all the bad input that's possible is a lot harder than you might think. Anyways, then here's incomplete validation. Um, some people truncate passwords. Microsoft did this. Your password can only contain up to 16 characters. If you put in more than 16, it doesn't look at them. Windows 95 did this. You could type in eight characters and everything after that and just ignore it without telling you. This is a fairly common thing. This shows that they're doing something incredibly dumb at the server, like storing your plain text password, because it ought to just be hashed with like MD5 or SHA-1 or something, better SHA-2, and therefore it could be a million characters in basically the same size hash. It shouldn't matter to the server at all how many, how long it is. Anyway, um, uh, this is another crazy thing. You might be able to have multiple accounts with the same name. This is possible at Phil's Coffee. Phil's Coffee had an app, and I booted up and had a website, and they can actually make multiple accounts with the same name. It's kind of screwy, but I figured out you can't, I couldn't find a way to get from one to the other. Otherwise, you can make an account like Rooter Admin and somehow get it to confuse you. But what I figured out by playing with it for a while is they actually have a hidden identity number that you never see, which is different for different accounts. Because I made two accounts, and I changed the password of one, and it kept them all separate. You never can see that ID number, but there is obviously a hidden ID number. But anyway, um, sometimes that happens. And uh, so once people say, some people have automatically generated names that just count up, and they're predictable. Sometimes the names are predictable because it's just the first name, your letter, your first name, and the first few letters, your last name, that sort of thing. Another thing people like to do a lot is give everybody the same initial password, like change me. I think we do that here, we used to do that here. So your account starts with your password is equal to your birthday. And you can pretty much guess people's birthday. You'll look at them, figure out how old they are. There's, you can get within a few hundred guesses. This is, this is a pretty terrible policy if you want to not have people getting in each other's accounts. Because there'll be a bunch of people who haven't changed it yet and it's the default expected number. Um, and then of course, sending them by email and SMS. Uh, people usually will never change it. So if you do send them a password, by email, you have to force them to change it right away. But even so, someone could have stolen and gotten in there already. Um, all right, and hopefully I've got the cahoots for this part. And we're right on track, except for my technical problems. Um, this is 129S, and this is chapter six. There should be a 6B, I think I saw it go by. I think I even marked it favor, good, good. So, some of my cahoots are working. Ah, but the music. I think I still don't have the music. Music is still shot, but you can't have everything. <coughs> no, I certainly do not want Siri. I can do sound? All right, anyway, this is such as life. My computer is too smart. I have a friend, he said the computer is smarter than I am, and this seems to be the case, too. Oh, it's right. They've hidden the... Digit. Yeah, yeah they, they've hidden the... Uh, the no, volume no, no, no. somewhere where I cannot get to it. You're struck by one digit. Well, yeah, that's, I think it's just a random number. 
but I don't really know. I do have a new contraption. Oh, I think that's it. This contraption is both VGA and HDMI. And I think it now assumes that there's a sound thing out the HDMI, which I'm not using. So it's a dumb adapter that thinks I'm plugged in with HDMI when I aren't. Anyway, that's, that's my latest hypothesis. So if that's true, then I probably could find some way to connect external speakers or something. Anyway. What's that? Well, it's, it is, this thing is set to internal speakers, but it doesn't seem to really be doing it. Anyway, um, yes, it, I feel there's some setting somewhere I can change. So what is it you prevent with HTTPS? It's really missing a lot without the music. If you go to Hacker Jeopardy at DEF CON, they all sing the Jeopardy what song. Da, 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 da. I know. Anyway, so uh, eavesdropping is what you stop. Okay. And uh, so which functionality is often just a simple persistent cookie? Mm. All right, that's remember me. Which one is often insecure because it doesn't validate the fields in the correct order? That's the uh, password change system. Sometimes you can put in a new password without putting in the old password by skipping over things. And which one might use a backdoor password that works for every account? That's user impersonation. This, by the way, happened to Cisco about five times in the last year. There was a hidden secret backdoor on many of their devices, and then another set, another set, another set. And it's also true the TSA uh, gun scanning things. Those things have hard door, hard backdoor, hard coded passwords that cannot be changed, and they're running on Windows 98. Anyway, um, that was uh, a famous hacker figured that out, whose name I forget, but um, anyway. Uh, make a thing here to put this in if there we are all right so here's some winners and i'm going to take a 10 minute break we'll pick up at 710 caitlin and win i think win told me who they were before but i don't remember what's that uh, e i uh, i can't oh you had something written down good um, yes, well, uh, even initials would do, but those are not the real initials, I think. Good. Good, let me see it. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. T Rob will do. Good. Thank you. All right. Good. All right. Let me save that. And if we have 10 minutes, maybe I'll try and get the sound working or find my lost cahoots or something. Um, I bet I can find the Lost Cahoots. They're on here. It's just that they must have the wrong name of the class. So, oh, I stopped the uh, recording if this thing will let me do it. All right. Some version of blockchain may eventually have some value, but right now it is essentially all fraud. Anyway, so then there's, there's implementation problems. Um, a lot of people have problems. Um, if you put blank or invalid usernames, or very long or short values or letters or numbers come in, many things fail open. Or when the login process fails, you end up getting in anyway. This is far easier to do in coding than you might think. It was true of some of my homeworks. I have these automatically graded homeworks where you put in the answer, and some students found on some of them, you can just leave the answer blank and it interprets that as correct. This is because I'm using PHP, and whoever made the PHP substring function is out of their mind. If you do the substring function, it returns a number, which is where the address is, but if it doesn't find it, it returns a Boolean false. 
So it doesn't even return a consistent data type. So when I wrote what was looked like the right function, it had this bizarre property of letting you in with no answer. It is, and that's of course, because I didn't bother to read the specs, I just said, well, I'll just write. Uh, I'm always, I simulate real developers very well because I'm always just rushing to get it done, throwing anything out until it works and then calling it done, which is what tends to happen. In my case, I have the excuse that it's good for students to hack my stuff, but, but anyway, um, so. The substring function has two different return types to make you sick. If it finds it, you get a number. If it doesn't find it, you get a Boolean false. So if you just write down like I did, if the return is less than one, it didn't find it, or less than zero, it didn't find it, you don't get the right results at all. You have to have a very strange test. That's... Well, they, they have an official example, and I had to literally copy example, but for, I just did the same thing I was used to doing in Python, thinking it would be okay, and it was not okay. And this is what people do a lot. You do what looks logical to you, and whoever wrote the thing had a different kind of logic. Anyway, so you try to have multi-stage login where you put in your name and password, you do a pin, then you have to put in like a token, and of course, you might be able to skip some steps here. Uh, you might be able to, um, if you get to step two, it might assume you must have already passed step one to get there. It might also assume that the same username applies to every stage, and the username keeps bouncing off, so I can log in as me, and at the last stage, change my name to root. And now it'll believe I passed the earlier stages as root. These things tend to happen. Um, so if uh, another thing it does is often checks a random challenge question, but in fact, I can often change it at the other end. And it's gonna repeat a parameter back that control, controls that question, or I can just refresh the form until I get an easy question. Um, the, past, the database on the server is a huge attack target. I can often get at that because there's a code injection vulnerability or a SQL injection vulnerability. And what I often find on the server is plain text passwords or I find hashed with routines that are not secure, like MD5 and SHA-1. These hashing algorithms were designed to be fast so you could hash a huge data file and compare it to the value. And fast means I can try millions of guesses for the password. What you need for a ha password hashing function is something slow, where it really takes 50 or 100 milliseconds to calculate one hash. That won't slow down the login process very much for a real user, but it will really slow down the attacker trying to go through the whole Rockview database, 100 million passwords. They're, if they have to try, you can only do five or 10 of those per second, they're really gonna be back to only trying the top 1,000 passwords or something, and now, just the name of your dog plus your birthday year is good enough, because it's not in the top 1,000. So that's the game here. So you, you have to decide in all security, security relies on threat model. There is no perfect security, and if there was, you couldn't afford it. So you have to make a model of what are you worried about, how important <laughs> is your stuff, how much, uh, how much do you really have to protect stuff, and then you can make reasonable judgments of what to do. And like I say, most people just use simple, pretty much uncontrolled username and password to get the lowest level of security because they just don't want to spend any money to go any higher or they just don't understand. And going higher is expensive in time, effort, and wasted user time and frustrated users that can't log in. You know, it's, there's a cost to have more security. You can put in all these things, you know, avoiding dictionary words. Um, well, there's one thing that's yeah. not in there, right? What's I that? It's like password Friday, password Tuesday, so. <laughs> I've never heard of anybody actually using that, where you change your password regarding something. I've never heard of anybody doing it. What they do is they have like an RSA token that changes every 10 seconds, which is the common way that do do that. I've never heard of doing by the day. You go by these uh, tokens, though, and like the Google Authenticator does that by changing every 30 seconds, which amounts to essentially the same thing. Anyway, so um, once you've got credentials, you have to protect them. When you're transmitting them, storing them, you have to, so of course, use standard encryption techniques. Don't make up your own encryption or you will just be revealed to be an idiot. Um, and you have to be careful where you put the credentials. They should not be in URL parameters or cookies. Um, they should be in post data. Um, you shouldn't be sending them back to the client and uh, whatever you store on the server should be hashed in a way that it's difficult to reverse. We talked about this, that be salted and stretched. Um, Salt means you have to add random characters to the password before hashing it. So if two users use the same password, they will not have the same thing stored on the server. And stretching means many rounds of hashing. Kali Linux uses 5,000 rounds of SHA-512, so does the Mac. 
That is very good. That takes a long time to do, like 50 or 100 milliseconds, and there's no shortcut. Yeah. So the the password, about the, the row. Yes, the row. I thought the same thought. There is a certain number of reps where it doesn't make you any more secure, but they need, it's the square root of n. So unless you're doing two of the 256 reps, you don't hit it. But can you make it more secure by instead of just hashing the hash? Yeah. And one of the hashes is something more complex because most of those hashes are just, you know, hex, you know, numbers. But if you were to convert that into like base 64 and increase the entropy, wouldn't that make it even more secure? Well, it would make it more obscure. If you do that, it would be more likely that the attacker wouldn't be able to guess the algorithm. So that adds, technically that's what they call obscurity, where you do something that is not mathematically harder, but it's less obvious. Like some people choose a password in a foreign language. And if you don't think of that, then it's pretty secure, but it's like putting the key under the mat. So I mean, that's, that, and some, you can mix those, um, but most security purists would say you should just have a lot of rounds of well-known function, then you have the most mathematical security. But you're right. And this is, by the way, what the military does. The military not only uses strong functions, but they also keep them secret. So you don't know what they are. They prefer all that security. That's why the official standards like AES and Chavon are only for non-military use. They supposedly have their own stuff that's different, which we don't know about. And I don't know how true that is, but they, they want to believe that and invite that to be true, so you don't even know the algorithm, in addition to it having a lot of rounds, so it's right. You would think that would be that. That's another layer of security of a different type. Okay. Anyway, so you can find it in this uh, thing called login.dex. It tells you how many rounds <laughs> and what algorithm you used. And by default, it's SHA-512, and it starts at 5,000 rounds. And you can change it if you want to, but that's the default, and that is considered good enough for most purposes. Um, so you remember me. You should only have something non-secret. Uh, if you let people store passwords locally, they should be encrypted with a key that's only known on the server. You should encrypt them with a public key and have the private key on your server, not there. Um, then you're supposed to make users change passwords, although I think they've recently finally knocked that off. Um, all right, and some people say you should use something other than the keyboard to stop keyloggers. That's possible. Um, you should, uh, you know, hang up on people as soon as something fishy is happening. <laughs> And if you have multi-stage login, consider that someone might be manipulating stuff between stages. Somebody might be doing the stages out of order. Uh, this tends to be a vulnerability. Yeah. Yes, and that is a risk if you use a password manager. If you use a password manager and someone can get at your machine while it's logged in, then they can totally get in your stuff, of course. So that's why you're supposed to have it like freeze when you leave and time out when you walk away so other people can't use it. But yeah, if you, that's why if you use some kind of automatic login, then you've created a vulnerable system. And there's no way the server can do anything about that, at least not an obvious way. That's why what some people like to do is have Bluetooth on their cell phone so it actually notices when you walk away and freezes the screen. All right. Um, all right, so I say you have to make sure that they're going through every stage and have some kind of special number on each stage so it knows that you really came from the expected page doing things in the right order. Um, all your authentication failures should use exactly the same code so all the error messages are exactly the same. So there is not a hidden information there. Um, you can do account lockout to stop people from getting too many invalid logins. If you let people choose their own usernames, it's more likely that it'll be something obvious, so you can generate un unpredictable long usernames. I don't know anybody that does this. This is really annoying. Tell your username is X47153. I, I suppose it's more secure, but I don't know who would put up with that. I don't know any website that makes you do that. Um, anyway, we talk about this. If you stop brute force attacks, after enough failed logins, you should disable the account or make them wait a half hour before trying again, or otherwise slow them down so people can't do it. Um, and here's another one, you know, you can put in a CAPTCHA to stop this also, so people have to answer a question like this. Most of these have been broken. Uh, the Russian spammers are the, the king of this, and now with AI they break them. But it is a whole bunch of extra work. Most attackers haven't got a crack for this, so it slows them down. Um, all right, you should have no way to change your username, typically. Um, and uh, the same error called a failure. These are the usual sort of things. Um, Account recovery. I think we're going backwards here somehow. All right. I ran out of some cahoots. I saw a chat message come through. And that is here. Is LastPass 
as far as I know, LastPass is all right. I think they got hacked once. I'm still using them um, because, you know, they passed it. As far as I know, they're all the same. I have never seen an authoritative analysis of password managers. Um, but I think all the big ones are okay. Just make sure you're not getting a fake one. <laughs> there are fake antiviruses and there are fake security tools of all kinds. But if you're getting like one of the 10 big ones, uh, I think they're probably all pretty much okay. And in practice, it's much safer to use a password manager than not to because if most people who do not use one reuse passwords at multiple sites. And that is a really bad idea because a lot of those sites are insecure and they get hacked and then people get in. So you really need to have a different password for every site. And it shouldn't follow a simple pattern either. Like this happened to Dan Kaminsky, one of the most famous security guys in the world, about five years ago before DEF CON. Two days before DEF CON, somebody hacked him and dumped out all his stuff. And one of the things they dumped out, they got in one of his research boxes, not a, a customer box. And his research box had all his passwords for his test accounts, and they were all fuck. Fuck PHP, fuck JavaScript, <laughs> fuck Yahoo, fuck Microsoft. Those were all his passwords. So that's, a, that's considered an insecure practice to do it that way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, he zapped it off. What are you going to do? I, he had a right attitude. He said, yeah, people get hacked. They hacked me. What do you do? You carry on. No point freaking out. It's just the cost of doing business. People are going to hack you now and then. So hopefully you have defense in depth. And he did, right? The box they hacked was his experimental box, practicing things. They didn't get like his real crown jewels, like the customer's data that are, have people or hiring him to secure stuff. So... I regarded that as okay, but um, I do come across a lot of people that totally freak out when they get hacked and think their life is ruined and you have to get over it. It's just like somebody steals your car, somebody breaks in your house, it's just gonna happen. You have to just try and get past it. I mean, it's crime, right? And we're all the victims of crime now and then and you can't let it ruin your whole life. <laughs> and I forgot to worry about the sound, but I'll try again another day. All right. Remember, Matthew Prince got hacked, the CEO of Cloudflare, and they hacked right through his Google two factor authentication, which wasn't supposed to be possible. And they improved the system after that, after he found out how they get in. They had a social engineering trick where they called somebody and found out enough information to get in past his two-factor authentication when, when Google two-factor was new. And so he, one good thing about Cloudflare is that every time they got hacked, and they got hacked five or six times, they have a complete explanation of exactly what happened and exactly how they passed it so this won't happen again. That's what you gotta do. Don't try to pretend it didn't happen and lie to people and shut them up, just come clean. That's much better. That's why I trust them. Nobody's perfect, but if you come clean and admit what you did, that is the most anybody can ask you to do. And then it's reasonable to trust you. You really are trying to do the best you can. Well, we're losing people again, so I think I better go. From 11 down to 10, so. All right, which one might let you in with an invalid or blank user? That's fail open. When an error condition occurs, it interprets that as true and lets you in. All right, how should you be restoring credentials? All right, that's it, hashed, salted, and stretched. What should happen if you fail at the first stage in multi-stage log? That's a pretty good one. Yeah, you should complete the logging process. This is important. If you stop after the first stage, then you let them do something like username enumeration. They can now try to solve the first puzzle separately from the rest. You just didn't finish, yeah. Oh, off the timing attacks. If, if the yeah. takes less time to do one thing, then you can figure out what you can do. Yes, exactly. 
Yeah, they should make them do the whole thing and then tell them to do it over. That is considered most secure. Um, <coughs> right. And uh, so what function should auto use auto-generated usernames? It's a recommendation. I think this is impractical, but they did not ask me. Are you still going to stuff our sites here? What's that? You're doing another event? Yeah, yeah. That's self registration. We recommend that. All right. So I got good. I got names. These are all real names. And when I know who that is, so when is in here twice, and Caitlin's in here twice. Good. And Stan is in here good. So those are my winners. So I'm just going to clean up and go up to the lab. And uh, today is Thursday, right? Are you doing your event? Or what day are you doing your event? Um, tomorrow and the next day. I'm doing events at RSA. Oh, no class tomorrow? No, there will be classes because that's at a different time. So here we have salts are supposed to be globally random unique. How are they stored server side? Uh, salts are not secret. <laughs> salts are stored in plain text with the hash, and they are transmitted to the other person in plain text with the hash. The salt is not a secret. It's just a different number, and it doesn't even have to be terribly random either. It could just be a counting number, but people do in practice use a random number. Salts don't have to be secret. So if you look at a Linux password hash, you'll see just a salt, colon, and then a hash. And the salt is in plain text. It's a very good question. All right. And um, but you asked about RSA. I should bring it up here in case anybody else is interested. Um, and yeah. Yeah. And <coughs> so RSA, Crypto Heroes tomorrow. This is our event. And um, then I have a Birds of Feather discussion next day. Those are my two things at RSA. But they're both over in time to come back here and teach class as usual. Well, so uh, I take part. I, I take part. Yeah. Well, I don't think I could walk, but I could take part. Uh, anyway, um, so, all right. Well, I'm going to stop the share and go upstairs. See if anybody wants help up there. <laughs>